you have concerns about sex education and censorship, have you had to think twice about anything you've published online or had anybody take major issue with it? Had anything taken down? Mm, always. <laughs> Every time. Okay. I mean. Hello, and thanks for joining us for this third episode of Prestasia Foundation's podcast podcast series, Sex, Human Rights, and CSA Prevention. Today, our very special guest is Euphemia Russell, founder of the pleasure education business I Wish You Knew. Euphemia is originally from Australia, but is currently in residency in Oakland, California, and she'll be talking to us today about sex education, intimacy, consent, and pleasure. So, hi Euphemia. Nice to be here chatting with you. Uh, firstly, could you please tell us a bit about yourself and what it is that you do? My name is Euphemia, and I'm a pleasure educator. So I work mostly with adults, focusing on how to cultivate a relationship with your body and your pleasure. And I am Australian, but I now live in Oakland, California. Okay. So because of that move, we got to meet. Yeah, which was very exciting. Mm -hmm. um, and so I have to question just a little bit, um, Oakland and Australia, Positivity towards sex, things like that. Have you noticed any major differences? Is it That's more a good question. Uh, closed off in one place than the other? Or? I think part of the reason why I came here initially was because there's such a great sex positive scene, mm. and I came to do some study a few years ago. Okay. And so I think that maybe the Bay Area or Northern California is an exception mm. to the rest of the US, from what I understand, around sex positivity. but. I also don't have much experience in that. Fair enough. Um, whereas in Australia, there is a lot of tantric practitioners mm -hmm. in Australia, oh, and there's a big tantric scene in Melbourne. Oh. But in terms of more general pleasure education, uh, there's very few. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, as a pleasure educator, what do you find you get asked the most? Oh. I don't know, I think as soon as people find out that my work is around pleasure and bodies, mm -hmm. they often ask me questions around other people's experiences. Mm -hmm. So they don't necessarily maybe feel immediately comfortable if they've just met me at a party or something to right. ask me questions directly. Okay. But sometimes they'll be like, oh, what do other people ask? Asking for a friend. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Asking for a friend. Got it. <laughs> um, but... I would say that a lot of people also just share their stories with me, okay. where there's very few opportunities to feel as though they can talk openly mm. without any stigma around sex. So they feel like they finally have a chance to talk exactly. to someone who might understand. Yeah, it. which okay. is not always so consensual. Mm -hmm. So sometimes I'm like, I'm a health educator. Mm. Gotcha. If I'm, <laughs> say for example, in in a car share or something, I don't necessarily have a whole conversation. I completely get that. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so, uh, as you, you just mentioned, that sometimes you call yourself a health educator instead of a pleasure educator. And before, I was asking you about what title you preferred. And could you tell me again why you prefer pleasure educator to sex educator? So, part of it is that I found saying sex educator, people assumed that I talk only in schools. Mm -hmm. Whereas pleasure education people immediately understand that it's more than teaching young people about puberty and STIs and birth control. Gotcha. Okay. So I do teach in schools in the Bay Area okay. and teach young people cool. uh, about all of those things mm -hmm. and many more things which is really exciting about pleasure and pornography mm -hmm. and healthy relationships and so on. But yeah, my own amazing. business, which is I Wish You Knew, mm -hmm. that is only focused on adults. So I want to make sure that people understand that it's pleasure focused. Mm -hmm. And also because even though pleasure is incredibly broad and dependent on the individual, Absolutely. I am different from, say for example, a sex therapist or different from someone who focuses more on like communication and non-monogamy and those sort of things. So that's in a way to, a way for me to allude to the fact that it's Normally my work is body focused. Gotcha, more of a niche yeah. in the overall versus yeah. Yeah, gotcha. But I'm always I'm always reinventing how that is so my, maybe it'll change soon. <laughs> Who knows? I find anytime I'm talking about sex or pleasure or anything like that with people, 
I always have to kind of readjust for whoever I'm talking to, or yeah. as I go through it, I definitely have moments of like, well, that didn't work, let's rewrite that one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, testing it out. Yeah, exactly, you know, the, the, test, the focus group thing. Um, <laughs> okay, so, um, so Prestasia operates with an overall sex-positive policy, but not everyone understands what sex positivity is. Can you explain what it means to be sex-positive? Mm, I think uh, Dr. Carol Queen has a really great who's also Bay Area. Mm -hmm. We've uh, worked with her as well. I bet you have. Uh -huh. um, for those people who aren't based in the Bay Area, uh -huh. uh, she explains, and so do other people, but I think she just has a really great way of explaining that it's not only about championing people, so you don't necessarily need to be to be sex positive, you don't necessarily need to be loving sex all the time, mm -hmm. or being really slutty, or kinky, or outrageous. It's about supporting people and giving them the resources so that they can make decisions for themselves. Okay. And so that could be being supportive of someone who maybe is asexual and wants to explore their masturbation but doesn't necessarily want to have sex with others. So seeing how sexual identities and desires can be so varied and celebrating all of them mm -hmm. and being positive about all potential experiences that people have rather than it being prescriptive and being like, oh, your sexuality is valid if it's like this only. Yeah. Which is, of course, harmful. Right. But just as cheerleading is harmful too, where it's being like, oh, great, you're <laughs> queer. And maybe someone's like, well, gosh, you know, I am queer, but it's also something that's like a challenge for me right now. Right, so, I'm still figuring out who I am. Yeah, okay. so trying not to assume and to provide non-judgmental, -judge accurate information for those so, people. So, really, basically, sex positivity is what you need sex to be and it being okay that you have that as your sexuality. So. Yeah, yeah, or having the right information mm -hmm. so that you can make decisions for yourself and have true autonomy and body autonomy. Awesome, well thank you, that's a very good answer. Mm -hmm. uh, you kind of covered my next one, so we'll move on <laughs> just a little bit. Uh, Whoops. <laughs> it's all good. I never complain about complete answers. Okay, great. Uh, consent is a hot button issue right now. Uh, what are your values and feelings regarding consent and what you do and what you teach? Mm, so I don't necessarily always uh, talk about the intention of why I started I Wish You Knew, uh -huh. but part of it is that, of course, as a society, we're moving from what is known as a rape culture mm -hmm. of entitlement and violence around bodies and sexuality and hopefully moving into a consent culture. Mm -hmm. And I think that, of course, it, it's a bit of a rough, shaky time for society and for relationships and people understanding their own boundaries. But so in ev all my workshops and my events and my consultations and my training with healthcare professionals and with young people that I teach within schools, it's always very consent focused, consent driven, and each workshop we start with some understandings of the space. Okay. So saying to people, it's it's hard to understand what consent is unless you're practicing it. Mm -hmm. So in this space, it is a don't don't touch without asking. So ask first. Um, don't assume things because consent can be just as much a part of just like how you support other people and what they choose to do, rather than trying to pressure them. So, uh, I know that your focus with your business is on adult pleasure, mm -hmm. um, but you do work with younger people and so and you do have, you as a pleasure educator under the larger umbrella of sexual health, that sort of thing, mm -hmm. uh, do you think that there is value in teaching things like consent and bodily autonomy earlier than we're teaching it now? Yeah, so the organization I work with, we start teaching at age eight, mm -hmm. and we talk about it in really basic ways. Mm -hmm. So that supposedly, I don't know a lot about child psychology, but mm -hmm. supposedly children learn and absorb as much information as they can psychologically understand mm -hmm. so it's trying to teach a little bit more than maybe is seen as uh, suitable for their age because mm -hmm. different maturity levels and different development stages um, of course not being inappropriate but trying to find ways for it to then to relate so with the eight and nine year olds we talk about uh, situations like asking for a hug um, mm -hmm. or choosing when they want to do something like giving a hug to someone else oh, and we talk about the platinum rule 
So it used to be the golden rule, which mm-hmm. is you teach others how you wish to be treated. Mm-hmm. And what we talk about is the platinum rule, which is treat others how they wish to be treated. Oh, that's awesome. And we talk about how you can't know what someone wants and needs unless you ask. And so going to sort of the basics of consent, Mm -hmm. to be like, your body is your body. Sometimes uh, parents or adults and guardians need to make decisions for you that are in your best interest and health. Mm -hmm. But in the end, you get to decide. And so giving them opportunities to sort of practice that and understand it. So, yes, I think everyone should be taught these things from the earliest possible age. I feel like we need to start applying the platinum rule and the way you teach it to grown-ups at this point, yeah. <laughs> if I'm being totally honest. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, it sounds so simple. but it do- I mean, and that's the thing. Like, So I worked with kids for a long time, and I know for a fact that very small children are capable <laughs> of understanding these concepts regarding mm-hmm. their toys and their bodies and stuff. Yeah. And so I, I love that, that method. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Uh, thank you for sharing that with us. Um, I'm going to change tracks just a little bit. Um, in your experience, what are some of the, bis- the biggest misconceptions and fears surrounding sex and in- intimacy? Oh, misconceptions and fears. I think the major fear that everyone has is that they're not normal. Mm. Interesting. So a lot of people just want to be told, your experience is normal or there is no normal Mm -hmm. like sex is weird for everyone right and there is no kinky because there is no normal there's just common and less common so i think that's a major fear that people have is oh my gosh my experience isn't normal i'm too this or too little that or Mm -hmm. too much that or no one else has this i'll never find someone else who has that same belief or fantasy Mm -hmm. or desire or need and so I would say that that is people's biggest fear and then maybe the misconception is that there is a normal okay that it's like oh I need to fit into something how lucky we are to have you teaching us these things (laughs) it's amazing how many adults really kind of because I've definitely suffered that at some point in my life Mm -hmm. feeling like okay nobody else is into this I'm Mm -hmm. all alone so Mm -hmm. and then I mean uh, dangerous as the internet can be, I, it definitely opened me up to what of like, oh, maybe I'm not all alone. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And then through that, I've gotten to meet wonderful people like you who have taught mm-hmm. me more, and so it's that's very interesting. <laughs> yeah, the internet is a great place. <laughs> it certainly can be. <laughs> Communities of interest. Yeah, I, I mean, that's the thing, like, it connects people. Mm-hmm. Whatever you can say about it that's bad, it does connect people and people who sometimes need to be connected, so. Yeah. And it connects you to information, so which we've kind of nailed down as like the most important part of this whole process. Yeah, (laughs) it's interesting because in my business I've always been very practical, pleasure, Mm -hmm. information focused Mm -hmm. and I want to do that but in the things that I'm cultivating this year I want to be able to provide resources to people Mm. but I want to create more spaces just of sort of deep facilitation where people can explore for themselves because sometimes information is basically just giving people permission to feel validated or feel supported or feel as though they've got permission to explore for themselves and so I think that science is incredibly important and it's very um, big part of my business but I also want to bridge that mm-hmm. between science and and experience so they're sort of more of like the understanding in the middle instead of like yeah. raw data and like feelings yeah. and, which yeah. I think I do do but I'm excited to combine them even more yeah so say for example I'm doing a butt plug dance party (laughs) awesome it's like I've got videos where I teach people like this is how you use a butt plug um before the event Mm -hmm. so that they can kind of explore so they don't show up to the party like yeah okay but now what do I do and what if I can't find a party yeah okay and then they can turn up and it's a very pg rated event where there's no nudity or hooking up but they get to actually just like explore in their bodies what feels good for them and it also normalizes exploration. Right. So I'm excited to kind of keep bringing those things together. Yeah, that is amazing and very exciting. And mm. I look forward to checking in with you and finding yeah. out how that's all going. Uh, but since you mentioned normalizing, uh, I am going to bring up stigma and normalization. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, what do you think can be done to help destigmatize and normalize sex and intimacy? Um, I think <laughs> some ways that to normalize sex is talking about it. Even just talking about sex is radical, in my opinion. It's true. So few people, say for example, people who think they're really progressive, Uh don't necessarily even speak openly about sex with their friends. 
So maybe they won't share like a porno that they think is really great with their friends or actually go into the details of what they've explored. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't, I think there needs to be a healthy boundary between privacy and sharing. Right, of course. But also just basic acknowledgement of not just the raunchy, outrageous things that people want to show off about sex, Mm -hmm. but the stories that show people, oh my gosh. Well, what better way to prove that, like, there is no normal and yeah. everybody is also, you know, whatever they are. So yeah. that really would open that up. Yeah, because I think um, stigma only comes from feeling as though it's not normal. Mm-hmm. I have often said that a lot of the world's problems would be fixed if we could just normalize masturbation and stop worrying so yeah. much about it. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Okay. If that's so. your thing. Absolutely. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> whatever your thing is. <laughs> Uh, so, let's see, what is your favorite advice or helpful hint that you like to give about sex, pleasure, intimacy, all three, just one, whatever you mm. want to answer on that one. Oh, if I had only sort of 30 seconds, normally I just say to people, center masturbation in your life, as you said, because then you're not relying on others to fulfill your needs mm-hmm. and wants and fantasies and desires but then you actually know your own body and know what you want so that you can articulate that to other people that is my favorite validation i've ever gotten in my life yay <laughs> yay <laughs> that's great definitely have things centered around masturbation and good there <laughs> uh, <laughs> sorry i think i cut you off there Did that's you? okay okay um what was i gonna say i'd say that is uh it that it's a really healthy practice i call it like research and development where Perfect. you get to be, be testing the things and actually create space for yourself to leisurely explore mm-hmm. like you would uh, generously give to someone else. And also practicing knowing your and articulating your wants and your needs and your fantasies and also understanding the power of like remembering to breathe and making sound and moving because I think that is the layer of shame that comes in mm-hmm. where a lot of us have learnt or experienced our earlier moments of pleasure when we didn't necessarily have the privacy or the space to do it. Right, and so, so quiet. It's like being quiet and small hide it and, and yeah. shameful. So sort of remembering to do those basic things Definitely can make things happens. so much more pleasurable. So awesome. they're kind of the quick things that I say to people that hopefully relate to them and their experience and hopefully make a big difference. That sounds like really good advice. Mm. <laughs> Uh, So let's see, do you have concerns about sex education and censorship? Have you had to think twice about anything you've published online or had anybody take major issue with it, had anything taken down? Mm, Always. (laughs) Every time. (laughs) Okay. I mean, I can't advertise on social media. Right. It's just a blanket ban of anything that's related to sex. So you can't advertise really anywhere, it's really just your own. And, yeah. and working your own website. Wow. Yeah. That's a huge amount of uh, just roadblocks to people gaining mm-hmm. really kind of essential and important education. Yeah. Also payment processes, a lot of them with yeah. Foster SESTA. So as a occasional sex worker, I have definitely run into that. Mm-hmm. Um, also an unfortunate roadblock mm-hmm. to people getting the education they need. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there's a lot of blocks. Yeah. Insidious. Uh, do you feel freer in publishing your stuff though, having your own website that you host, or do you feel like you yeah. still have to be just as careful? No. Okay. No, not in. Even in when I'm sending out newsletters and so on, sometimes uh-huh. they get flagged because they go mm. into other people's emails. So it's kind of the only place that I feel I have full, mm. unbridled expression Shh. is my website. Okay. And so I'm actually building that up a lot more Mm -hmm. because social media is kind of scary right now. And there's a lot of unknowns about if sex education will be supported. Right. Uh, Have you had any, like, major backlash, like anything specific that you can think of? Just, like, anything, like one subject that just drove everybody crazy and you were like, well, I'm not doing that online again. (laughs) (laughs) I had, I kind of loved it, but I had... um, (laughs) Lots of people posting on a squirting event that I, I've done a few squirting events, but one in particular, and it was a lot of uh, sex worker exclusionary radical mm. feminists or swerfs. That's unfortunate. Um, where they were just saying that it 
didn't exist and it was oh, pee <laughs> and that um, people only desired it or felt like they needed to do it because of porn. Oh. And in one capacity, like, squirting has become much more prevalent in porn right, in the last five years or so. Oh. But at the same time, people should be able to decide what they want to do for themselves. Absolutely. Um, rather than people swooping in. And there are lots of women who do it whether they want to or not. So, yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. to call it something, like, that's really stigmatizing. Yeah. Something that, like, some women can't help. So. Yeah. I also teach in the workshops how to not squirt uh, it or how to stop yourself from it, doing yeah. it. So, if like, you muscle want to. manipulation. Yeah, and just, like, techniques so that you can actually have... It, it can be part of body autonomy of being like, okay, I want to, or no, yeah, I don't want to. Maybe I don't want to show this part. Yeah, or, or in whatever. this moment. Yeah, or at this moment I don't want to change the sheets. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, cool. Uh, so finally, Euphemia, if you had to pick one thing about your vast array of knowledge, what is it that you wish we knew? <laughs> <laughs> well, I suppose maybe that that's similar to the question of what you are saying, mm -hmm. of like, what would I tell people? Um, but I, I preface this question or this answer to say that I love that my business is called I Wish You Knew because it's so vague that everyone kind of already <laughs> knows what I'm alluding to mm -hmm. without actually knowing because it's kind of the taboo That's awesome. of being like sex, mm -hmm. death. Maybe the, you know, there's a few things. Right, there's a few things that we that don't know about does. and we're all confused yeah. and questioning so yeah no that's amazing <laughs> but I actually started my business as a storytelling project of uh -huh. of thinking like um what are the things that you you wish you you could tell your younger self mm -hmm. about your sexual identity or yourself or what are things that you wish you could tell your lovers and your loved ones that maybe you find challenging or what do you wish if you're standing on the top of a mountain and had everyone's attention in the world that you would like to <laughs> say to them. Okay. And so I suppose I also don't want to be prescriptive in what that is, <laughs> but basically just saying that bodies uh, can be such an amazing place for exploration and pleasure, and it's not necessary that everyone has a good, comfortable, safe experience with their body, mm -hmm. but that there can be a lot of growth and exploration in exploring the connection between your mind and your body and your nervous system. So I speak a lot about the nervous system. Mm -hmm. And that people deserve to have that information if they want it. So that's not necessarily a specific answer. No, which is, but it's a very good answer. But so. yeah, purposefully vague so that people can <laughs> okay. decide for themselves. So what you wish we knew is uh, what you know. <laughs> or what I wish people knew was their wants and needs and desires and boundaries and pleasures for themselves. I think that's a good thing to wish people knew about. Yeah. <laughs> All right, well, that is the end of my questions. Thank you very much for chatting with me. It's my lovely. pleasure. Thanks for watching or listening to this episode. Please subscribe to make sure you don't miss the next episode. If you're watching on YouTube, you can do that by clicking our logo here. And you can also donate to keep us on the air. We look forward to having you join us again on sex, human rights, and CSA prevention. Bye for now.